Our next speaker is Cressida Ford, who probably has taken the longest trip, longest migration to get here. Uh, Cressida is uh, from the National Center for Indigenous Studies at the Australian National University and is Deputy Director. everybody. Um, while this is getting set up, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, traditional owners of this beautiful country on which we're meeting. I'd like to thank you for your welcome. It's fantastic. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge all the knowledge that everybody brings. Yeah, how's that? That better? Sorry. I'd also like to acknowledge all the uh, knowledge that everybody brings to this room that enriches the space. I think that's very important. And I'd like to thank the organisers of, of this uh, meeting and for including me. I feel very honoured in that, so thank you. Um, that's me up there. Um, my name's Cressida. I work at the National Centre for Indigenous Studies at the Australian University in Canberra. Um, we're a small centre. We're multidisciplinary. Um, we try as hard as we can to be interdisciplinary, which might explain my slightly meandering talk today. So... Um, I'm involved in three projects at present. One is about uh, a number of issues surrounding repatriation. One is about deficit discourse. And uh, one is about the impact of genomics on Indigenous identity in Australia. My, ma my main research area and professional practice over the past 20 years or so has been the repatriation of Indigenous human remains housed by museums. Within this, probably the most consistent topic of interest has been the history of the concept of race and scientific racism and in particular how the practice of such science gathered data according to pre preconceived notions of hierarchical racial difference and in its protocols of measurement and analysis mapped these preconceptions onto the human body. This practice constructed, maintained and reified racial identities that had little to do, of course, with how people viewed themselves and have had lasting impact. Um, through my interest in the 19th century construction of racialized identities, I've become interested in what we call deficit discourse. This is discourse very invasive in Australia, which consistently understands Aboriginal identity through a lens of deficit. It's not hard to identify deficit discourse as a legacy of the race paradigm, nor is it hard indeed in my um, startup readings uh, to identify it in aspects of genomic research, such as addiction research. A notion introduced by the colonial project, deficit discourse, is also one that members of both the settler population and the indigenous population may now engage in. Will such discourse be identified, I ask myself, in these early conversations about DNA for repatriation? And if so, how should it be shifted? What will it be its impact? So I thought it's worth just... Uh, I put some stuff up here on discourse because I think it's important. It's how we know, how people say truths, how we think about how it constrains us, how we view the world. And I think as data comes into this space, it's important to, to keep these, these big meta things in, in the forefront. We use Foucault, as so many people do, because he's very useful. Um, in the 19th century, um, I, I put this up uh, also just to, just to explain the slide. So, I'm interested in the techniques by which um, people uh, produce embodied identities. And sometimes it's useful to step outside of your own uh, area of uh, familiarity around race studies and then look at it in terms of gender. Uh, and this is just a quote on the left by um, somebody in the manoeuvre at the beginning of the 20th century talking about Paul Broca's work. And just a little cartoon which I think um, uh, encapsulates somewhat of what we're talking about. So in the 19th century, scientific interpretations of human remains provided authoritative truths about Aboriginal people, and these influenced how the dominant society perceived and acted towards them. 19th and early 20th century scientific analysis of human remains can be seen as part of the lens through which European culture viewed Australia's Indigenous population. It influenced how people, Aboriginal people were perceived and valued, yet it in turn was upheld by preconceived notions of racial hierarchy. Viewed in this way, it can be seen as part of what Atwood has described as Aboriginalism, 
taken from Said's work on Orientalism, a mode of discourse that constructs, guides and constrains European knowledge about the Aborigines. Discourse is important to consider in this space because it speaks to larger social processes in which production of knowledge about people play a part. This tension between concepts which approach difference as natural or mapped has been discussed by a number of people. How genetic variation is used in some health research and ancestry determination appears to promulgate or at best allow the former concept to resonate more than the latter. At the least, it is exceptionally vulnerable to such representation. And as others have said, and people have been making uh, the point this morning and today, when we focus on biology, we turn our gaze away from the social world. The social world and our identities within it are highly complex. Identity is not vertical and solely cemented in blood and lineage. It's contextual, horizontal, produced through our relationships with others. Biology plays a part, but it's a part that is much less clear and much less important than it's given credit for. The repatriation of ancestral remains is an extraordinary indigenous and cross-cultural achievement of the last 40 years. I think that's really worth saying. It's extraordinary. Uh, repatriation itself has achieved many things beyond the return of ancestral remains, and it's proving to contribute to such things as healing, well-being, cultural transmission, and it's been incorporated into indigenous development approaches. Repatriation can be a counter-narrative to deficit discourse because it is all about agency. Uh, you're familiar with these, I need not lay on them. Um, it's all about agency, indigenous agency. In real life, it is all about adaptability, dignity, innovation by those seeking the return of the remains of their ancestors. Um, I put these up because um, at the top there are some quotes from Blumenbach in the late 18th century, which shows that even then people were really having problems with trying to define things. And I put the other quotes up because in Australia, I'm less familiar with Canadian and uh, US history, but in, in Australia this is, there is this narrative of passivity, I guess, um, that people just did not uh, oppose um, the colonial project, and of course they did. And part of our project is we look at some of the uh, archives relating to the theft of remains, and you can see in them resistance, opposition, um, when people could to the taking of remains. Um, it also makes clear that people knew perfectly well what they were doing was wrong. Um, so I like to put those up just to remind me of all those things. Um, but repatriation is also insightful uh, because it can be a window through which to view underlying assumptions. One example is the assumptions revealed by retention arguments. I've been particularly interested in those that engage with identity and notions of authenticity seen through the lens of race and blood quantum. I include within these things like the questioning of Tasmanian Aboriginal claims on the basis of the erroneous belief that Tasmanian Aboriginal people had become extinct in the late 19th century, or the accusation observation that repatriation demands from Indigenous Australians were purely political in motivation, usually when delivered by people who might not look or act like Aboriginal people should. I feel, therefore, that repatriation aggravates or irritates or disturbs a kind of comfortable discursive space and in doing so can reveal a very constrained biological view of identity and culture when ascribed to Aboriginal people. Repatriation process can also engage strongly with identity because of the need to identify communities of origin. Perhaps unsurprisingly, given the above observations, repatriation practice can be a bridge to notions of identity based on biology. And I think this can most, be, uh, can most easily be identified in the use that is sometimes uh, put of cranium, cranium metrics for determining ancestry in repatriation processes. I find this quite puzzling. So while some archives may record Aboriginal group names or, if lucky, the names of individuals, most provide information in terms of geographical location from which the remains were taken. This information varies in its specificity from Australia, New Holland, to very, very, very exact locations. Now, in Australia, I think this is worth uh, stressing, it, it's a different situation to this country. So in Australia, with some exceptions, should an area be contested or shared? Geographical area enables identification of community of origin. We don't have this category you guys have of cultural affiliation. If remains are shown to have been thieved from this area, the people who are in that area are the traditional owners and they speak for those remains. 
They don't have to approve a cultural affiliation uh, to the remains themselves. Um, so place, therefore, identifies who has the authority to speak about these remains. Place and social group or cultural group identity or language group, as we might say in Australia, are very much aligned. The degree to which place, social identity and biological identity align may not be so straightforward as, has, as we've heard some, from some um, speakers today. So cranium metrics is used in repatriation to assist ancestry determination. Um, I would say it's not, not used all the time, um, and it's quite difficult actually to determine when it is being used because um, reports are produced confidentially and things aren't published um, for many obvious reasons. So it's used to assist ancestry determination, um, both to try to provide details when no archive information is present and as a part of, of a suite of evidence when archival information is available. Um, in the kind of rough familiarity that I'm gaining in this space, the weight that is given to craniometric results in repatriation is testament to the continuing belief in the veracity of this technique, but also the continuing dominance of biology as a determinant of identity. This is despite the critique of craniometrics over the last 10 years or so, of which Alan touched on some, and the quantity of work for decades that has sought to understand our social identity. A focus on biology in this manner, in repatriation, does not appear to engage at all with the rich sociality of humans, not only in terms of our identity, but also in terms of how this informs people's views, obligations, and responsibilities towards the deceased. If we roll this biology ball along for a bit and follow it to its conclusions, whether we agree with it or not, one inevitable outcome of the comparison of the morphology of ancestral remains in museums with those in a database that are not considered to be of mixed ancestry, what a horrible term, means that the remains of Aboriginal people who do not match because they have Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal ancestry become questionable to return. All this raises up the same issues with biological identity as mentioned above, but in a repatriation context and prompts questions such as, if claimants identify as Aboriginal, do they have less right to the remains of their Aboriginal identifying grandma simply because her father was English? Indeed, do they have any less rights to their English great-grandfather? I find posing questions in this way usually makes me feel that the whole thing is ludicrous. Um, so indeed, if these kinds of issues are occurring at the phenotype, will they also have salience at the genotype? Because of the commendable reservations that Indigenous people have voiced about genetic science, there has been little genomic research undertaken with members of Australia's Indigenous population. This, however, is beginning to change and currently includes things like development of ethical frameworks and community consultation surrounding um, a biobank collection at the Australian National University. That's called the National Centre of Indigenous Genomics an increase in Aboriginal people testing their own DNA through commercial services such as 23andMe, and I have no idea of the, the amount of people who are doing that. Discussions about DNA research in health, um, how this should be done in an appropriate manner that is of benefit to Aboriginal people according to um, our ethical guidelines, and um, work on ancient DNA as a means of understanding human migration. All of these have very significant ethical considerations some of which are being discussed and some of which aren't, some of which be, are being explored and some of which aren't. An additional potential use, potential use for genetic testing that has been identified is its use for repatriation purposes in relation to those remains that are poorly provenanced, to which I'll return shortly. First of all, I'd like to consider briefly the way in, in which genomic science has been reported in the Australian context as a means of understanding its vulnerability to affirming old perceptions. Um, speaks a little bit to my question to Alan earlier about why is it that we fall into wanting to affirm these perceptions, I guess. So um, in 2011, Rasmus and et al. published results of the sequencing of the genome from the hair strand of an Aboriginal man met by uh, Alfred Haddon at a train station at Kalgoorlie in the 1920s. Kalgoorlie is in Western Australia. The article produced information, uh, interesting information about ancient migration routes into Australia and received much attention in the popular and science media. I was interested, as I always am, that's why I um, browse through uh, Bioanth textbooks, 
to see how people are visually representing uh, the people that they're describing. Um, so I was interested in how the media was going to portray this new discovery and in particular how it was going to portray Aboriginal people. There were some counter-narratives to the usual deficit discourse uh, and I haven't done a systematic review, this is just me reading stuff. So there were some counter-narratives, uh, there was Aboriginal trailblazers as they were called by the BBC. However, in all cases in which a visual image that I found accompanied the article, the photo used to represent Aboriginal people was that of people stereotypically considered to be easily recognisable as real Aboriginal people, i.e. familiar shots of dark-skinned people in the desert or conducting traditional ceremonies. Not dark-skinned people at a computer or in an aeroplane cockpit, or fair-skinned Aboriginal people in the desert managing pastoral stations, or perhaps most accurately, a young man on a, tra on a train station in the 1920s. I should point out here that the Goldfield Aboriginal Land Council supported the work on the Hare Strand and considered that the research had not threatened their own views of where they'd come from and their longevity in that space. Nonetheless, the representations in the media did little to counter stereotypic notions about Aboriginal identity. Now, these kinds of representations are really important today because of the history of the use of race and blood quantum in Australia as a function of control and power and continuing accusations of inauthenticity and fraudulence should people not, not look like their type or how they are supposed to or how their identity is constructed by others to be. This is part of the legacy of the construction of identity that occurred in the last century and has real impact on people. I could write a lot about that. If anyone has, uh, has questions about it, it's how it's being played out in Australia at the moment, please come and see me. Um, this myth of extinction is one faced by many groups, such as the Tasmanians, for example, who I noted before, and one which they have had to fight against and continue to encounter, whether from government or ignorant populace. So against this historical and discursive background and the deep reservations that are held by many about any further research work being undertaken on remains that have been housed so long in museums, particularly DNA work because of its destructive uh, sampling technique, is there a future for DNA research to assist communities in their repatriation endeavours? Now, some communities are thinking about it, so clearly they are um, uh, interested in looking into the options. So in Australia, I'm not aware that DNA research has yet been used within repatriation practice, but it is certainly beginning to be on the table. The Indigenous Repatriation Unit of the Australian Government has released an information sheet for communities about scientific testing to assist people in their deliberations. This sheet notes that scientific testing involves complex ethical and cultural sensitivities and in many cases can raise more questions than it answers. It notes the need to balance the risks of loss through destructive sampling against potential benefits is one of many difficult decisions in this space for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It also makes clear that as with any research there is potential for error, misinterpretation or bias and that with specific reference to DNA research to determine the genetic relationships between living people and populations of the past, it may be necessary to obtain samples from present-day Indigenous peoples for comparison and reference. The ethics of maintaining and protecting these modern samples is a further challenge and needs to be recognised by all stakeholders. Now, the issues of reference collection are extremely um, uh, relevant here with not enough time to go into it. There are many unanswered questions about what DNA research for repatriation purposes might look like. As noted above, in Australia, place determines who has the authority to speak. We don't know if it is possible or possible consistently to establish social identity from biological identity using a comparison between ancient DNA of that of people today, but I expect not, and um, I think that's been um, shown also by the talks today. We don't know, for example, whether archive records that establish place and DNA testing that establishes genetic ancestry would lead to the same result. The way to consider matters surrounding repatriation is to return to first principles. The repatriation is about the return of control or the resting back of control and the indigenous groups have the right to determine the future of their ancestors' remains. So the primary issue for the application of DNA research is who has the authority to speak and what context is DNA research being considered? I think three hypothetical scenarios help to explore this point. The first is one in which ancestor remains have been returned to the control of a regional community organisation but only have regional province, provenance, and that organisation might consider ways in more, which more localised authority to speak for the deceased might be identified. Uh, 
In this case, indigenous control is clear, community-driven project is possible. From this can flow things like assertion of IP conditions, data manage requirements, etc. People's cultural protocols can be followed. The second scenario might be one in which ancestral remains have been returned to Australia but have not been repatriated to any group because they have only national provenance. Now, ancestral remains in this category are currently housed at the National Museum of Australia, and there's been a consultation pro uh, process to see what might be done of them because that's not a happy situation. And people have come to a kind of cohesive agreement um, about where they should be kept um, and why a place of memorial and grieving and education with Indigenous control. So in that case, in the future, with Indigenous custodianship and maybe broader consultation processes, DNA might be of use or might follow the Indigenous control um, requirement. The third scenario might be the assertion by a retaining institution that DNA testing should be undertaken to prove connection. I've not come across this situation, but I'm sure it's been thought about. Uh, biological connection certainly has been considered by museums as a determinant of standing in the past, which I always find is strange, of course, because uh, biological um, connection is not a determination of ownership if it is applied to curators. At this stage, the question lies not in whether the results of DNA work may assist communities, but in ensuring that su should such an avenue be pursued, that it's community driven. To sum up, I think there's a number of distinct cha challenges. One is ensuring community control and community design processes. The second is countering discourse, which is all per pervasive in a lot of, uh, certainly in the popular media, also in the government policy uh, area as well. I think understanding the role of biology and sociality and identity is incredibly important. Finally, communities have considered many other options to the questions of how to appropriately inter the remains of unprovenanced individuals. This has occurred regionally, and the National Keeping Place consultation shows that there are cohesive views on what could be done nationally. In the end, social answers using social processes to problems introduced by the undignified collecting practices of people long ago may be the avenue that produces the resolve, healing, dignity and peace that funerals and memorials in all their sadness are supposed to achieve. If DNA research is also part of this process, it's important that it achieves a similar purpose. Thank you.